Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order. It is 102-103 p.m. Um, as our chair and vice chair are out today, we will need to let elect a chair pro tem. Um, we will need to make an official motion and second for that chair pro tem. Graham has already graciously <laughs> volunteered, um, but if someone would make that motion, we make a motion. Uh, I would like to uh, move that uh, Graham Johnson be appointed chairman pro tem for this meeting. Second. Nick? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm with the quorum. Do I have to vote for myself? Yeah. So I'll, I'll throw an I in there. Okay. okay. Great. Awesome. You can do that with reservations. There you go. Exactly. So I'll now turn the meeting over to Frank. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, as Brittany said, welcome to the August 1st. Frank Marks Federation. It has both in person and virtual, so we'll kind of work back and forth, but I'm turning our backs to a purpose. So we can that. Um, Awesome. We'll start with um, some audio tips before we jump in. Just an introduction. No oh, introduction, but just thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with Nick. Uh, I'm Nick Fusionis. I'm an architect developer uh, that was nominated by the American Institute of Architects. Hello, I'm Gary Petrie. I'm an architect. Uh, I was nominated by the Denver Planning Board. Graham Johnson, uh, Preservation Project Manager, nominated by the Denver Planning Board. I'm Brittany Bryant. I'm Denver Landmark Preservation staff. Hi, I'm George Dennis, a retired law enforcement and old house addict, and I was appointed by History Colorado. Hi, I'm Erin Hummel. I'm a landscape architect, and I was nominated by the American Society of Landscape Architects. All right. Um, now for the audio tips. Uh, we do have folks joining virtually today. Uh, a couple recommendations for better sound quality. If you have downloaded Zoom on your computer, uh, laptop, tablet, or phone, you're able to change the audio settings to add a background noise suppression. Sometimes in the open room, that helps. Um, and also adjust your speaker and microphones to their maximum output so that we're able to hear. Um, hopefully, you're able to hear us. For presenters and public commenters, uh, when it's your turn to speak, you'll be promoted or able to unmute uh, landmark staff will help with that. So then you'll see an icon at the bottom of your screen to give options for different speakers or microphone inputs. Um, but once you're unmuted, we should be able to hear you. And uh, so we'll go through that for each of the virtual participants. And uh, moving forward from there, we do have a meeting record. That meeting record is for June 20th of 2023. Uh, are there any comments or clarifications from the commissioners for the meeting record? Hearing none, a motion to approve the meeting record. Good. I recommend approval of the June 20th, 2023 meeting records. Second. Second. Gary, second. Perfect. Aaron, for the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. I wasn't here. And we don't need a full form no, that we can just yeah. Perfect. That works. Uh, motion passes. We will move next into a brief public comment period. Uh, this is a period not tied to any specific project that's under review today, but at each meeting we provide an opportunity for public comment about any general preservation matters. If anyone has comments about preservation in general, please raise your hand, or if you're joining us by phone, um, you can dial star nine to raise your hand virtually. Uh, anyone wishing to make a comment has up to two minutes to make their comment. No hands raised in the room. Uh, anybody joining us online? Um, at this point, then, we will move into the consent agenda. Uh, we do have one project on the consent agenda this week. Um, items that the uh, commission reviews on the consent agenda are all reviewed together uh, and passed with one motion. Commissioners, if there is any concern with the project on the consent agenda today, can request to pull it off for further um, deliberation or comment. Uh, at this point, does anyone have any concerns about the consent agenda? Okay. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to make a motion? The consent agenda item for the record is uh, item number 2023-COA-273 at 2062 Larimer Street in the Ballpark Historic District. 
I move that uh, we approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Nick. Second. Second. Aaron seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Right. Uh, opposed. Abstain. Right. Five votes. The consent agenda uh, is approved. If your project is on the consent, you are all set and uh, able to leave. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you. So, <laughs> so much you did on last time. There you go. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, at this point, then we'll move into our design review process. Now uh, we have three different projects to take a look at today on the design review. Uh, these will go through the process that's described on the screen where we will look at each design review project individually. Staff will introduce the application and share their presentation. We will then hear from the applicants who have up to 10 minutes to share any additional information they would like about their project. And following the applicants, we'll have public comment periods up to two minutes per person who wishes to speak about each specific project. Um, at that point, any clarifications by staff will then allow the commission to move into deliberation where we will make a decision and vote. Um, for any of the applicants or public wishing to make a comment, please remember to share your name and address for the meeting record prior to making your comment as well. And Brittany will have a timer on the screen here to help us keep track of the time. So our first item on the design review agenda today is number 2023-COA-246 at 2724 Stout Street in Curtis Park. Um, so our first application is for an accessory dwelling unit for a contributing structure in the Curtis Park um, Historic District. This home was constructed in 1886. Um, it is a mid-block property, as you can see in the aerial image here. Um, it is a front-facing gable structure, um, and there is no structure in the rear yard that will require demolition, as you can see on the images on the screen. Um, so the proposed accessory dwelling unit will be a flat roof structure. It will have a one-car garage um, with kitchen uh, and stairway entry on the ground floor, and then two bedrooms on the second floor um, with a hallway and two bathrooms above. Again, flat roof structure. There is a cornice proposed on the alley elevation and the interior lot elevation. Uh, the cornice design on the alley elevation and interior lot um, elevation are different on both facades. Um, so here is the um, alley elevation on the uh, left side of the screen and the interior lot elevation on the right side of the screen. Um, again, this is a one car garage, so we do have a small um, garage entry off of the alley, which is recommended by our design guidelines. Um, there is a man door off of the alley as well that allows access into the accessory dwelling unit. Um, and then there is a gooseneck like fixture proposed on either side of the man door and the garage door. Um, this ADU is constructed of brick and will have a stream force detailing separating the first floor and the second floor. On the alley elevation, the window openings are actually proposed to be arched, as you can see here. Um, staff do have some concerns over the uh, proposed arched openings, as the primary structure does not have arched openings on the front facade, and we feel that it does make the ADU a little bit more elaborate and decorative than the primary structure. Um, however, arched openings are common within the Curtis Park Historic District, so it's not totally without a, out of context, um, but we do have concerns on this particular ADU as it does not match the primary structure. Um, additionally, staff are concerned about the placement of uh, window header heights and sill heights as there are a number of um, placement uh, variety on this particular ADU. Most of these elevations will not be visible from the public right away due to the tightness of the lot. The most visible elevation is the alley elevation, um, and we do have concerns there. Um, again, as you can see, the, the arched um, openings do not have the same header heights or sill heights. The um, proposal for the uh, larger arched window is, I believe, a sliding window. Um, however, there is not some, there is some conflicting information in the material specifications and the window schedule. 
Um, we don't typically allow slider window operations. We have allowed slider door operations in areas where they're not visible from the public right away. Um, and then this particular window door operation will have a metal balcony um, provided there. Um, the other window is a fixed arch opening window, and that is showing a flower box below if you're curious as to what that is. Um, on the interior face, uh, staff are also concerned about the placement of the um, stream course between the first floor and the second floor. Uh, it makes the second floor uh, look very tall and the first floor to look very squat, which is not typical of the surrounding historic context, um, where you typically have a taller first floor to second floor height. Um, on the interior face, there is a door proposed with uh, divided lights. We do require divided lights to be a simulated divided light with a spacer bar or a true divided light. We do have some questions about that as well. And then three light fixtures, um, again, the gooseck fixture proposed for the ground floor. Uh, the cornice on the alley elevation is a more decorative cornice with bracket detailings. And then the cornice on the interior lot elevation is a simpler cornice. The staff had rec have recommended a unified cornice and more specifically the interior lot um, cornice design as it's just simpler in design and more um, of its time. Uh, here are the interior elevations. Um, again, you can see that uh, placement with uh, window sill and header heights are different, and we do have different window operations on this um, accessory dwelling unit. Uh, the building will not have a cornice on these elevations. It will have um, a step, or sorry, not a step, a um, soldier course double um, coursing for the parapet detail. Again, same similar concerns with the second floor looking taller than the first floor on this particular ADU. Um, here are some of the details of the proposed accessory dwelling unit. So all of the windows will be inset into the wall plane um, and the windows will have a precast concrete sill as you can see in the upper right of the screen. The um, proposed structure is proposed to be clad in this Alaskan brick. Um, which the commission has previously approved um, with string course detailing in this pebble gray, which is a color the commission has also approved. The pebble gray specifically is on the 101 Broadway edition. If you want um, a real life example, I don't think this word color photographs well ever, um, but we have approved that color. Staff do have minimal concerns over the brick coloring as it's not traditional to the orange red brick that is found in the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, but the existing structure has been painted and this um, color scheme does match the color scheme of the existing primary structure. Um, this does help distinguish the accessory dwelling unit as new with these two colors. And again, the commission has approved both of these colors in the past. Um, here you have an example of the cornice uh, for the um, Front and rear yard, again, the cornice on the interior alley elevation, or sorry, the interior lot elevation is the simpler design. And then the cornice proposed on the alley elevation is the more decorative one with the brackets. And then just the light fixture detail. Um, so the applicant has looked at the surrounding historic context and feels strongly that the arched openings are appropriate, as again, you do see them within the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, here's just some examples of arched openings within the district. Um, the structure, the primary structure in question is this, again, beige structure, which is sister house to um, this structure, which does have an arched opening. Um, however, I do not know if that opening is original as both of these structures have been um, heavily modified. Um, one, the one in question, that is the primary structure has a door. Um, and then the uh, one that is the sister house, that is a replacement window, and it's unclear to staff when those alterations occurred. Um, so we do have some concerns that the ADU is a little bit more decorative than the primary structure, particularly with the cornice design um, on that alley elevation. Um, so staff are recommending conditional approval, and there are a number of conditions um, due to some 
uh, questions about what is in the material specifications. Um, but essentially, we are recommending a window opening found on the primary structure, such as a simple square opening and a restudy of sill and header locations. Uh, do not use a sliding window operation and instead use a historic window operation, uh, such as double hung or casement windows on that rear window. Provide clarity on the French door design. And again, that relates to the divided lights. Um, do not use horizontal exterior panel door. Instead, um, use a door design that is commonly found within the district. Um, so I guess I didn't really mention this, but the doors are horizontal panels, which are not typical of the Curtis Park Historic District. Um, typically, you have half lights, quarter lights, three quarter lights within the Curtis Park. Um, although the door does not have a mid-century design to it, we feel it's more indicative of an interior door that you would see within the Curtis Park Historic District. Adjust the placement of the string course to create a taller ground floor and then simplify the cornice parapet design. Uh, again, we would recommend the parapet or cornice design that is proposed on the interior lot base. And then provide additional clarification on the site work. Thank you, Brittany. Questions from the commissioners for staff? I have one. Um, on, on the alley view, the large arched window, that little fence, that, that's not a, a balcony, is it? That's that's just a don't fall out kind of thing. Is it? Um, it's a it's a Juliet balcony, like you could oh, actually step out on to it, but okay. it is a balcony. In terms of what zoning classifies it as. Any other questions? Okay. All right, at this point, um, applicants, if they're in person or online, um, you have 10 minutes to tell us about your project. Please remember to start with your name and address. Let's see if I can get my charger to work. Afternoon, Commission. My name is Jeff Baker, uh, 2422 Champa Street. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start off, and then uh, Jonathan Haley, the homeowner, will follow. Uh, thanks, Brittany, for your presentation. Uh, I'm just going to kind of walk through her staff report and uh, address some of the uh, some of the issues that staff has with it. So, uh, just to clarify, the doors and the windows presented are all aluminum-clad wood from Weather Shield. Um, all windows meet the design guidelines set forth in 4.8 A through J. Uh, this is a sliding door actually on the rear alley. That is a uh, sliding door. Uh, the reason we did that is to, to French doors will take up too much space. And that really is just a safety railing. It's, I think it's protruding three and a half inches. So you really can't stand out onto that balcony. Although balconies are allowed in the code now, um, that is not what we are proposing on this one. Um, but yes, this, that's a sliding door because in swing would take up too much of the interior space. Uh, that view also has limited visibility, and those sliding doors, like Brittany mentioned, have been approved by the commission in the past. Uh, to address the arched windows, the arched windows are all over the district and is a character defining district, a uh, character defining feature of the district. In fact, the main house did originally have an arched window on the front, as seen on the twin house to the south. It was converted to a duplex at some point, has been returned to a single family home. Um, and we do have some pictures for clarification if you guys need to see the arched uh, brickwork that's in the front of that front of the, ho the house there. Um, so that subject property was modified to be put uh, put a door in, like I said, in that picture in the presentation, you see the house to the left and the house to the right. So the house to the right, the twin, the house to the left also has arch windows. So all three of those do have arch windows and you can see many of the rear facing buildings on the rear uh, side of the property as well do have the arch windows. Um, this design, including the arches, are backed by heavy support from direct neighbors. As you can see, the letters of support that we've received, uh, including um, four past presidents, uh, Curtis Park Design Review Committee uh, sent a letter of support. Um, so four past presidents of Curtis Park neighbors, including the first president, Rich McGinn, who began the landmarking process for the district, uh, the past chair of the design review has also voiced support for this design and for the allowance of ADUs to be beautiful buildings and not boring ugly boxes. 
which on our last meeting with you, um, members of the commission had raised concern that what is currently being allowed for ADUs um, will be regretted down the road for the lack of any character or design. They're just boring boxes. Um, and to address the differences in the roof, that has been all over the district. You've got uh, single story um, Italianate cottages with flat roof Italianate style ADUs behind them. You've got single story Queen Anne cottages with flat roof Italianate styles in the rear. And you have Italianate style homes with Queen Anne gabled roofs in the rear. So um, there's lots of examples of, of previous projects that have been approved with uh, different forms. Um, let me see here. The French door on the yard side is a very expensive, very well built aluminum clad door with uh, internal spacer bars between the glass. It says it right in the quote that's attached to the bottom of our application. It's like a with grill between glass. It's like a WBG, uh, and that means with grid between glass. Um, the only manufacturer shown for that for this door is the Weather Shield. Um, in addition, and like I said, it's a very expensive well built door. That's a six thousand dollar door. Uh, in addition to the to the, uh, in addition, the vil only visibility from this door is from the back of the house. This lot is super narrow. You can't see that door from anywhere else. I also provided examples of those doors in the district, those style doors in the district with those uh, divided lights. Uh, moving on to uh, the existing structure as a Queen Anne, I kind of mentioned this as well. We did go through and simplify and minimize the detailing on those cornices, removed a, a significant amount of detail. Um, to simplify them down and do a modern interpretation of the old. Uh, the also, the two cornices will never be visible together. So you can't see both of them at the same time. So you wouldn't be able to compare that they were different. Uh, the reason the floor heights are articulated based, are, 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 with the way the floor heights are represented with the brick coursing, um, those heights are articulated based off where the floor actually is. And when we did move up that middle level brick course. We actually had two to start with. We removed one that, that Brittany recommended we removed. And we did move up that second one, but it just doesn't work when you go around to the, the other facades of the building. The coursing runs into the side of, the, of the, the window or door openings. And so we felt like where it is right there. The, tall, the top does look taller, but those basically the floors are both 10 feet and then you've got a two foot parapet on the top. So yes, it is gonna look like it is a little bit taller on that upper level. Um, see here, the use of the brick does meet the standard set forth in 4.20 of the guidelines. The use of a different brick color has been readily approved throughout the district as um, uh, Brittany had mentioned. This building will have zero visibility from the street. The different colored brick also differentiates and reinforces that this brick, this building is not a historic structure. Um, and I believe Brittany just mentioned that as well. Uh, as far as in addressing it being a subordinate to the front house, this building is subordinate as it is only 648 square feet, cannot be seen from the front. And as stated by the Denver Zoning Department, the fact that this building resides in the rear, it's actually in the rear 32.8% of the lot, makes it subordinate. Um, the rest of the building, the main prim primary house is in the front, uh, front part of the portion of the lot. So the fact that it's in the rear, what Denver Zoning Department said that ADUs are subordinate just alone by the fact that they're mandated in the rear 35, and this is actually in the rear 32.8%. So today we ask that you approve this design as we feel the design meets all the guidelines, comes with tremendous support from Curtis Park Neighbors Design Review, surrounding neighbors and four past presidents of Curtis Park Neighbors. The homeowner is a longtime resident of Curtis Park and wants to build a beautiful new building, has clad the entire building in brick, and as you know, that is an extremely expensive cladding to put on the building, but it's going to last and it's going to stand the test of time and stay timeless. The design meets landmark, landmark guidelines in no way would this building detract from the neighborhood. Um, the building adds beautiful timeless character with an appropriate nod to Denver's, one of Denver's best landmark districts, and we ask for your full approval today. And I'll let Jonathan take over from there. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, my name is Jonathan Haley. I'm the owner at 2724 Stout. I've been in the neighborhood for 14 years and this has been uh, a focus of mine from day one, obviously stacking the uh, finances to make sure that this is actionable, but I'm a proud resident of Curtis Park and it is my intent to construct something that has parity within the neighborhood 
is very synonymous with the look and feel of all of the uh, building designs. Uh, if you were to look at this image here, you know, you can see my house and my two neighboring properties. What's not evident, you can see it in the pink building, but those two buildings are identicals. On my block uh, on 2700 Stout, there are three Queen Anne's that were constructed at the same time with exact floor plans. And they both, all, all three have that arched window right there with another entry point. At one point, um, a previous owner had converted my single family into a duplex. So I technically right now have two front doors. So the door that's evident in the image right now was actually a window analogous to the pink structure. Directly across the street at 2724 Stout, or I'm sorry, 2740 Stout, is another identical Queen Anne that mirrors the same image that's in the pink building. So the arched window is a character defining feature of my neighborhood. Even more particular, all the surrounding properties in the front facade facing Stout. And then when you're looking at the image to the right, those are the Kinesi buildings. All of my surrounding properties have arched windows. So it's not an outlier to incorporate the arched within the design. If anything, it is actually representative of all the surrounding properties and will fit in aesthetically. Um, and my goal was to develop to design something that has the look and feel, has the quality, and um, Ex exhibits all of the character defining features that I feel I'm proud of. Uh, so everything that Jeff has said was spot on. Uh, I feel like this design hits all of our key points in augmenting, elevating the, the neighborhood. And I, I uh, you know, prior to all of this, I sought support from all the surrounding property owners, including the ones on California and on the other side of, uh, of uh, the alley. And everyone has adamant support and is really, really proud of the work that we've accomplished. So uh, all I ask is a uh, due consideration and hopefully uh, uh, approval. All right, thank you for sharing. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? I've got one uh, regarding the door that is in the uh, back, the French door, and the comment about the divided light, is that a, a fully internal um, you know, spacer, or is there an external kind of mullion that simulated divided light look for that door as well? That's internal. So like if you look on our full original application and you look at the actual spec sheet from Weathershield for the quote, um, it says down towards the bottom of the description, uh, with grid between glass, Square interior bar profile, no interior bar finish, satin. So that's an internal grid. Understood. Thank you for clarifying. Absolutely. Okay. Um, any public comments to follow the applicant's presentation? Keith, we'll move you over here. Hi, can you hear me? Can yes, please start with your. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, two minutes. Hello. We can hear you, Keith. Yep. Oh, okay, great. Uh, Keith Pryor here, twenty four eighteen Champa Street, chair of the Curtis Park Design Review Committee. Um, just wanted to make a few comments on the uh, arched window in the alley. Um, it's well, actually, the arched opening. Um, you guys. Uh, last week just or two weeks ago approved a sliding door on the consent agenda on an ADU uh, less than three blocks away from this um, and so if a sliding door gets put on the consent agenda and is approved I'm not quite certain why uh, this sliding door would not be approved um, the arched window is apparent uh, on that block and within the district, uh, the house itself originally, if the door was not there, would have had an arched window as a main entry point uh, to architectural feature for the property as the sister house next door uh, clearly does. Um, we do uh, 
agree with staff as far as the doors that the horizontal uh, should be switched, but it's an easy switch to a vertical uh, two panel uh, with a light or a four panel with a light above. Um, but overall, we really appreciate this design and we ask for you to support it uh, with just the additional uh, few conditions, but the arched window should definitely and the arched opening with the slider is definitely one that we support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. Are there any other public comments? Okay, looks like we're good. No hands raised here in person either. So any recap? So. I do have recap. Um, <clears throat> a balcony is allowed per code now, with, and that's uh, to um, in relation to the update um, to the ADUs that was adopted I want to say June 6th. Um, however, balconies have always been allowed in the Curtis Park Historic District. So you may see a more balconies over the alley in the future um, as that is a change. Um, we weren't provided photographs of the arched window on the primary structure, but I think we'd be willing to consider an arched opening if we had more information regarding the existing openings on the structure. Um, I still have concerns because most of these structures have arched openings on the ground floor and the arched opening is proposed for the second floor on the ADU. Um, in terms of the door, again, I um, there's the information is not clear in the material specifications. There's a French door shown without divided lights in the material specifications, and there's a French door shown with divided lights in the material specifications. There's casement windows, sliding windows. So again, just asking for clarification on those window operations. Um, if that is a sliding door window in that opening, there's conflicting information on that in the um, material specification. So again, the application materials just need to be really clear uh, for, um, for stamping and permitting and inspections. All right, uh, at this point, we'll move into deliberation. And uh, with the comments and the breakout in the staff report, does it make sense maybe to work our way down that list together? Is everybody comfortable with that? Approach? Sure. Or, uh, start with the first one, um, which I think looking at the you know header and sill locations and, and also talking about our arch top windows, we kind of start, start maybe with a primary conversation piece there. Um, Commissioners, any thoughts on, on the first edition? Um, I'll start. Um, my feeling is is that uh, the uh, applicant has done a good job uh, in designing um, a subordinate structure that is in keeping with the district and the difference uh, differences between a Queen Anne or a ghost of a Queen Anne, which I would argue that the existing house is Italianate uh, cube sort of in the back. Uh, I, I understand and can appreciate uh, that it's appropriate. The window openings though, I do agree with staff uh, in that they could be uh, simplified, aligned uh, and um, in a way that it presents more, a more unified design uh, for that little box. Any thoughts? Well, I, I would echo that I'd like to see consistency in the windows. Uh, looking at the alley view here, we have Lots, all of those features are consistent with what you find in Curtis Park, but you don't have all of them all in one house, I don't think. Um, so going for the windows consistency with either uh, the arch windows or the straight uh, square windows, I'm also really glad they use brick. Uh, that's a that's a biggie uh, for uh, for an additional uh, 
an additional building. Uh, my other notes will show that, uh, yeah, the cornice, I, I'll agree with the cornice uh, staff's recommendation on the cornices. That really should be consistent all the way around also. Um, the fact that all of these are are seen in places in Curtis Park and they're all on one house kind of makes the ADU uh, not very subordinate to the original building. It needs to be simplified a little bit, I guess is the, is the right answer uh, with, with these details. I'm, I'm okay with the, uh, uh, the built course being where it is. Doesn't seem to strike me one way or the other. Um, but the window consistency, the cornice, and uh, just some simplification, I think, would be well appreciated here. And you go for the break. Aaron, Gary, any thoughts specific to the, the windows? Or can we move into the next piece after that? I, I guess I support the staff's uh, recommendation about making the windows consistent. I think the thing that troubles me a little bit is the alley expression is the kind of expression you put on the front of a building rather than the back of a building. And um, I think that's uh, not really consistent with the character of the neighborhood. So I agree with what the staff is saying. I did want to make a comment about the applicant's use of the word subordinate as defined by zoning, which would be different than what subordinate would be defined by the standards that we use. So uh, just to make a case that uh, what zoning says is subordinate, it's not necessarily subordinate, but it's consistent with the uh, preservation guidelines. Good point. So I, I think I'm hearing on the first condition then that um, arrangement, kind of administration balance of, of alignment and everything is, is something we agree with. I think the specific arched shape of the window versus you know, a square traditional double line. Uh, some of the that we've mentioned many times and, and is specifically mentioned in the staff report. Are there, I guess, commissioner's thoughts on the arch window type as it relates to the alley facade, you know, um, separate from the overall alignment? And, and kind of I think I was referring to the idea it wasn't explicit, but um, the arched window tops on the alley facade are, I would consider, Kind of inconsistent. But that's a that's a front facade feature rather than a rear facade mm -hmm. feature. And so I, um, um, I would not be opposed to using like a segmental arch, um, which occasionally occurs in the district, but the full arch, um, I think, is uh, not consistent with the character and the neighborhood. Um, that maybe moves us, we can circle back as we get ready to make the motion if there's any further discussion. But the second condition noted was the clarification of a sliding window versus sliding door. I think that knowing that it's a sliding door mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe helps us to answer that. Um, that refers to the second floor window on the alley side. Mm -hmm. Yes, the That's large that. window that currently yeah. has an arched grandson. But the real it's really a door. Yeah. 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 Uh, balcony. I think that's correct. That I um, so then the next, the French door design, I, I, I asked about that simulated divided light because, you know, I think there's a little bit of an architectural language piece. We talk about simulated divided lights often mm -hmm. and a spacer bar so that we don't get a shadow line or strange visibility. Uh, a distinction that we don't often make because we see a lot of windows that have a true, you know, physical Button that's applied to the glass on the outside and then the spacer bar on the inside. The guidelines don't say anything specific about simulated divided light inside versus out, but that was the question I guess I had. Precedent and staff experience wise, um, you know, a smooth plane of glass versus something broken with the unapplied button. Um, I do think they say something. Do they? I was looking briefly at yeah. uh, four point. We so. don't want allow the interior buttons. And that um, was the thought is that that door yeah. may need to also mm -hmm. have an applied interior yes. and exterior button. Um, I was looking at guideline 4.8. The... It 
There is also an image in our guidelines of what we require in terms of the, the profile of a particular. Um, um, so I think for the third condition, and that was my clarification, I don't remember some similar thoughts or. Well, I think the way that the uh, condition is written provides staff with any way to be able to make that judgment. Perfect. So, Agreed. I think it's fine. Yep. Uh, the panel door was mentioned both in public comment and uh, during the review. Uh, Mr. Strong, thinks about that. I, I agree with the staff recommendation that it mm -hmm. should be a vertical panel rather than a vertical panel. You know, which door in particular are we talking I think about? Uh, there's a couple of doors. There's the like side that. elevation and the, the alley entry. I think the, the door, 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 the man, yes, the man yes. from the yeah. yeah. One of them, and then there's, there's another one on the side. I think yes. that's one on, and then it would be a yeah. side elevation. Yeah. But they're both similar to side. Got it. Um, all right. Well, then uh, condition number five is the string course. George, you mentioned that briefly. Um, mm -hmm. Other thoughts about kind of proportion of the masonry detail. I guess I don't have a problem where it is because if you move it up, I'm not sure that it creates the overall effect that's intended because it's really not a good place to put it that, you know, um, because it doesn't really tie into other architectural features. So um, I, I, I guess prefer to leave it like it is. I would agree, I think, with the sliding door and the planter box, and you get a few things mm -hmm. that start to be where they want to land if it was more. Yeah, yeah I, I get staff's comment regarding proportionality, but if if they're married to it, I don't think it's in violation of the guideline. And, you know, if this was a infill structure rather than an ATU, I think we might take a different look at that. All right. Um, number six was the cornice. George again mentioned yeah. the you know the different uh, different front and back. Uh, and noted as the applicant said that this is a pretty tight. You may not see both at the same time, but it felt to me a little bit like that gets to your comment earlier, Gary, of the primary versus secondary facade here and how that detail. It kind of treats the alley facade as a primary facade. Yeah. I don't think that's. Uh, consistent with what the guidelines well, well it, it, it goes back to the subordination yeah. and and i that was an excellent point because if the adu is behind the primary structure and you put disney's castle back there mm -hmm. that's not going to be too subordinate so uh, i i'd like to to see the a more simplified cornice on it Right, and our last condition here was uh, uh, clarifying the site work, which I think was a, a fair ask, something that to coordinate with staff. Any other comments that folks would like to share? I think I'm hearing then that maybe all conditions except number five, uh, we felt like mm -hmm. for conditional approval here. Did we, didn't we also? Two. two oh, I'm two sorry, number two, two because of the door. Yeah. That's correct. So. Conditions except for two and five, if somebody would like to make a motion. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to conditionally approve application number 2023 COA 246 for the new accessory dwelling unit at 2724 Stout Street, as per design guidelines 4.1, 4.8, 4.18 through 4.20. 5.6, 5.18, character defining features for the Curtis Park Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, use a window opening found on the primary structure, such as simple square openings and restudy window sill and header locations. Two, provide clarity on the French door sign. Three, do not use a horizontal panel exterior door and instead use a door panel design commonly found on exterior doors dating from the district's period of significance. Five, simplify the cornice parapet design on the alley elevation. And six, provide an existing site plan to clarify site work proposal. Thank you, Gary. Is there a second? Second. George, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 
ocean ferries. Um, congratulations and good luck with your project. Uh, I can help work through those conditions and appreciate your time presenting today. So we will work through here to the next one. Then our next design review project is number 2023 COA 275 at 300 Lafayette Street in the Country Club Historic District. Uh, and again, for me to present. So, our next application is for an addition within the Country Club Historic District. This is a contributing structure and it is located on the corner, um, as you can see in this aerial image here. There was an addition added to the side and rear. Um, I don't know entirely when that addition was added, um, but it was outside of the period of significance. Um, the existing structure is um, a Denver square form, but it has Tudor detailing. And the primary entrance is um, on the um, <clears throat> side elevation which is kind of unique to the neighborhood. Um, so many homes in Country Club, Driving Park, Alamo, Placita have these side entrances um, where they're kind of concealed on an interior lot elevation. Um, the applicant is proposing to keep that as the entrance, but also introduce a new uh, entry off of the side street on um, the south side, or sorry, the south side of the property. And then the existing carriage house structure was constructed during the district's period of significance. However, um, garage structures are not considered contributing within the um, Country Club Historic District. And it does have an um, alley access, um, but the doors do front onto the side street. Um, so here is the front of the structure. Um, and then you can see on the uh, right of this image, the addition um, that was added. Uh, the addition is somewhat in the Prairie Usonian style, so um, staff feel that the uh, existing addition is not compatible in architectural character with the existing structure. Um, so again, because this house is complicated, here are some additional photographs of the, the home. Uh, these are in your packet, and you can zoom in on those. Um, and demolition is minimal to the historic contributing fabric. So the applicant is proposing to demolish um, the roof form above this existing one-story addition on the south side that is original to the home. Um, however, this uh, sunroom space has been heavily modified um, and this is located on the side of the home, although it does have visibility from the public right away. Um, staff does not, do not find that it impacts the character defining features of the home. And then in terms of demolition to contributing roof fabric on the rear, it's principally this, um, this hipped uh, um, west face and this dormer that is original and then modifications to the non-historic addition that bumps out to the side along the side street. Um, so demolition to contributing fa fabric is very minimal in nature. Um, so here is the uh, existing floor plan, and here is the proposed floor plan. So the applicant is uh, proposing to modify the existing non-historic addition by adding a second story addition on top of that, and then a one-story connector addition between the primary structure and the garage, and then two additions on the garage structure, one on the north elevation, and then one on the um, um, west elevation to expand the garage space, and that has to do with the reorientation of the garage doors. So the applicant would like to put garage doors on the um, alley elevation and eliminate that side concrete um, drive aisle that takes up much of the yard space that you can see here. Um, they will be retaining the original garage doors on the south elevation, so those will still be visible from the public right away. Um, however, you will now enter the garage directly off the alley with doors facing onto the alley instead of the side street. Um, so in terms of modifications to the existing footprint, the applicant is proposing to um, make some modifications to the basement, which will be um, minimally impacting the exterior of the structure. There will be two new egress wells, um, one along the um, East elevation, or sorry, west elevation for the historic structure that does face onto the 
primary street and then one egress elevation onto the secondary street. Um, those wells are constructed of high quality material and will be minimally visible from the public right away and do meet our guidelines for egress wells. On the first floor, um, the new gar the uh, garage will be connected to the primary structure with a new one story addition. Um, this addition is minimal in footprint. It's mostly an entry space and a mudroom um, to allow the transition between the uh, garage and primary structure. Um, there are steps in this uh, space which um, result in the window stepping on the uh, front facade that is visible from the side street. Um, however, how, because of how far set back this addition is, um, we feel it has minimal impact on the um, visual character of the um, structure and then already it is modifying um, addition fabric on the rear elevation. What staff have the biggest concerns with is this new entry feature that is proposed um, off of the south elevation. We feel that it does take away from the prominence of the primary entrance along Lafayette Street and our guidelines do talk about additions retaining the original primary um, entry orientation. Uh, we would not mind an entrance here at this location. However, we do feel that it should be simplified in design and would recommend uh, eliminating the small uh, bump out addition entry feature along the south elevation. Um, here is the uh, second floor plan. Again, um, on the non-historic addition, a second floor will be added. This will have um, minimal impact to the historic fabric. And then you can see the roof form for the connector edition, which is just a simple uh, gable roof form. Um, there is a shed roof addition on the north side of the garage. The Arno did have concerns over this shed roof addition. However, staff are not concerned as it has limited visibility from the public right away. Um, but I do want to point that out as the Arno did have concerns over that. Um, here are the elevations. This is the um, the front elevation and the rear elevation. Um, so minimal modifications to the historic fabric on the front elevation. Uh, again, most of the modifications will occur on that non-historic addition that was added to the home. And these modifications are again to um, better relate these additions, the addition to the primary structure as it is um, not compatible currently in staff's opinion. Um, the rear elevation has already been significantly modified, um, so the applicant is um, is proposing to uh, make changes to that rear elevation to unify it um, with a more unified first floor with a bay bump out, as opposed to the undulation that you see on the rear elevation um, currently. And again, most of this is uh, non-historic fabric. There is a historic dormer here that will be demolished to accommodate this new roof form that you can see. Um, this is the north elevation. This is the interior lot elevation where the primary entrance is. This is the most decorative elevation of the historic structure. Um, and this is where most of the historic windows are intact. The applicant is also proposing to replace the windows in the primary structure to better match the historic windows. The windows, um, that are in most of the historic structure have been replaced, um, but the applicant will be using casement divided light windows that match the windows that you see on the north elevation. There is a minor modification to an existing window on the north elevation. So this um, double hung window on the ground floor will be modified into a casement that is a little bit uh, narrower in size. This is not visible from the public right away. And though it's difficult to tell in this elevation, the entry feature does bump out a little bit more, so it really has limited visibility. Um, and then on the connector addition, there will just be a door introduced on this elevation. Um, <clears throat> here is the side street elevation. Um, so this is, again, where most of the modifications will occur to that non-historic addition. Again, staff have concerns over that entry feature and the visual prominence of that entry feature and would recommend that that be um, scaled back and be made to look more like a secondary door. Um, on that sunroom, you can see the roof will be demolished to accommodate a rooftop deck. Um, we do feel that this is an appropriate change as it is on a side elevation, not the rear 35. 
um, and it does uh, does allow um, for views into the side yard. Um, on the connector addition, again, you can see those window sills and head heights do step because the interior space does step. So as for the garage, as I mentioned, the doors will be retained on the south elevation, um, but a new garage entry will be added to the east elevation that you can see here in this elevation. Um, it is inset from the wall plane um, to allow for the garage form to be maintained, um, but it will um, will be the will allow for the combination of the the cars and, and such in the garage with the new addition on the um, the west elevation, and then you can see that shed uh, roof addition that is proposed on the north elevation that staff again built. Um, does not visually impact the historic fabric or the surrounding context as it's not visible from the public right away. Um, so generally staff are recommending approval. Um, here you can see the proposed uh, addition and rendering in various viewpoints. Um, we just do have a few conditions and they principally relate to that secondary entrance. Um, so we are recommending that the uh, 60 foot square addition on the south elevation that creates the appearance of a primary entrance uh, be redesigned to a secondary entry to avoid competing with the primary entrance. Um, we are asking for the height of the site wall to be confirmed. So this, um, the applicant is proposing to expand the existing site wall, as you can see in these elevations um, renderings here. This is pretty typical of the surrounding historic context in Country Club to have site walls with fencing on top. And then we just need um, details on the locations of the light fixtures to ensure they comply with guidelines 5.717 and 5.18. Thank you, Brittany. Any questions for staff? I do have a question. So is having a perimeter site wall with fence more common in this district than retaining the Denver Hill? Yes, the, all the properties on the corner here have um, site walls with fences. Additionally, the guidelines talk about retaining the Denver Hill when it's an individual landmark property and not necessarily a property within a historic district, which this is. Thank you. It's an updated guideline. That is an updated guideline. Uh, can, we, uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the South, the new entry uh, mm -hmm. in it, the uh, little portico that's created there? and and what staff's objection is to that? Um, our guidelines talk about when you add an addition to not um, to retain the appearance of the original entry. So we're okay with there being a door here, but with the um, expansion of the site wall, walkway, um, covered feature that you see in the how decorative this entry is, we feel that it competes with the primary entrance. Um, so again, we're okay with an entrance here um, as the site wall is non-historic. We don't have an issue with introducing a new entry on the site wall. That's pretty common within the country club for corner properties. What we do uh, have concerns with is the porch configuration and um, side light configuration. I think there are several ways that it could be redesigned. So we're not you know, specifying specifically, but just recommending that the Bump the 60 foot square foot bump out. So this is an alcove um, here that be eliminated from the design. And uh, for my benefit again, the where the facade that that's uh, being added to, is that back to original and then that's being added to the original? That's on that the, the non historic edition. Yeah. So that there isn't an objection relative to that. Um, so, they, yeah. You know, they're defacing something that's historic. It's not. It's not. But guideline 3.3 .3 says design an addition to a historic structure to respect the character defining features of the district retain the appearance and orientation of the primary entrance. So we feel that this entrance is competing with the primary entrance. And this home is difficult because again, that entrance is concealed. So it's not like it has like some homes in Country Club, a grand porch and 
where yeah. that really retains visual prominence. Uh, I walk through here all the time and I just, I think there's precedent for this. Um, I think this is good to discuss in deliberation okay. unless you have additional questions. That's fine. Uh, any other questions from the commissioners? All right, at this point, uh, we'll allow the applicant to present for up to 10 minutes. Uh, we've got applicants here in person. <laughs> And then I'm going to thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. We'll just start with the name and address. Hi. Yeah, Ready, Brittany? Okay. Okay. Thanks. okay. Whenever you all are ready. Hi. Thank you. Kristen Park, 4111 East 18th Avenue in Denver. And uh, Brittany, once again, uh, summarized our project perfectly. We, you can see it's kind of a story of two architectures. Um, uh, Brittany and I had actually discussed like, what do you call the original area? And we were kind of thinking maybe English arts and crafts. And then we have like the prairie style or Usonian. So our goal was to make that um, more cohesive, the, the um, existing addition. And um, regarding um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the front door. This, this property, it has such a gorgeous front door and you can see it more um, in my elevation drawings because it's very difficult to see how handsome this is because it's tucked so far back. And if you look at the site plan, um, you can see that it's on the north, it's icy, and we, um, the main staircase is right near there. So we would always keep this as our front door. The mail's gonna go there, that's the legal address. But, um, you know, we just wanted to have another option, particularly when it's snowing. And um, I tried to simplify that uh, secondary, let's call it back door is what I'd like to call it on, on fourth. Um, so that, you know, we just had something that wasn't so um, secluded like this is currently. But um, it's, uh, you know, very handsome part of the house that is difficult to see. And you can even tell by my photos, it's kind of hard to get in there to take the photos. So, um, so thank you very much. And now I'll let the owner, Zach, speak. Sure. Face the camera towards me. Great. Uh, sorry, my name is uh, Zachary Richardson, and I'm the property owner of 300 North Lafayette here, and I've been living there for about a year and a half now. Um, I spent my entire life in Colorado witnessing and embracing the transformations that have been shaped the state into what it is today. My family has deep roots in Denver, as we have been longtime residents of the beautiful state of Colorado and take immense pride of our state. Likewise, I'm eager to honor this legacy by caring for a historic home with the same dedication you see before you. Preserving Colorado's iconic status has always been a steadfast commitment in my life. I'm fully aware of the responsibility entrusted in me in safeguarding this historic for many generations to come. I've had the privilege of knowing Country Club Historic District as an iconic staple in Denver, bonding reminiscing of my childhood, which began when my family moved to Denver in 95. I've witnessed many transformations in that area over the past 20 years. However, I, I understand that there is a sense of concern about preserving the essence of my childhood and ensuring the country club remain significant parts of Denver's heritage. Now, regarding this particular home, it holds a special place as one of the oldest resident residences in the country club district. And the challenge is to present the untapped potential that past architects couldn't foresee make it into this exciting prospect. Together with Kristen Park, we have envisioned changes that we believe are necessary for the home to establish itself firmly and gain recognition as a true historic gem within the community. Now, these proposed changes would further enhance the significance and contribute to the area's rich history. And by approaching this project with great care and sensitivity to its historic value, we hope to create a home that will continue to be cherished and celebrated by future generations. And I humbly wonder whether by preserving this history, I too become part of its legacy. I vision myself and my fa future family, as well as generations to come, carrying on traditions, values, and integrity. Granting me the opportunity to be a part of this history will be a momentous decision, one that future generations will remember when this home is designated as an iconic residence for all to cherish. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Should we stay here? Or? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Well, I think that. Uh, Focusing on each of the positions we went to, we can start at the positions of the core, uh, the secondary, extra physical work, and the primary conversation. I think we're going to have started to look at the top one. Yeah. A lot of the corner, not a lot, a handful of the corner, uh, the, the houses cited on corners. In the past, and I don't know if this is you know prehistoric uh, designation or uh, post-historic designation, but I do believe there is precedent uh, for uh, reorienting uh, the front of a house. So there are neighbor houses, I believe, that uh, serve as precedent for this being done. Um, and so that is a, just a question I have to the broader group uh, as to what our general view is of those things. I think the guideline, um, jump back to this one real quick, that Brittany mentioned, you know, with the historic addition and this being a small addition, I, I feel like, you know, compatible with the scale, massing, and rhythm that it mentions, and then that appearance and orientation of the primary historic entities, the fact that that entrance has remained untouched, I think is a benefit, right? And then you've got a masonry structure with stucco, but this is kind of differentiated as a, a wood you know, frame or glass, it appears. I mean, you've got a combination there that sets it apart materialistically also, I don't like. So, you know, I think I'd probably side with the fact that being a unique condition, but also with the big side yards and here you're talking about the site fence. That and I have that. something to add to that. So yeah. let me direct you to the sixth page of the packet, which is the site plan. And this relates to the hierarchy of entries. It, as the site plan has been changed for this, the wall opening is larger now at the secondary entry than at the primary entry on Lafayette, which I think makes it appear then that this has become the primary entry instead of secondary. I don't have so much of an issue with the little alcove being a different material and its design, but I think the site plan is starting to indicate this is the main way to go in. And it's by the width of the walks. And it's not exactly dimensioned, so it could be a graphic. Um, but I think if you look at how the site plan and the openings in that wall relate to the primary entry as it was originally to the secondary, it could also help with that understanding of the history there. Yeah, I'm sure that that's good. Well, I, I agree with the staff's recommendation regarding um, how this kind of reorients the building and creates a, like a new facade. And that's coupled with that there's the other thing that's kind of bothersome um, rel relative to the guidelines is um, it's going to be hard to distinguish what was the original building and what is the next edition and now what is this edition? Um, the um, attention to detail, which I appreciate, is, is so strong that this composition looks like that was the original design, which I think is a problem in terms of um, the guidelines um, regarding making changes uh, relative to being of their own time. And I think the way this uh, vestibule is detailed kind of complicates that further. And that's why I'm agreeing with the staff's um, condition that if we're going to have 
pedestrian access on this side of the building that it needs to be much more subordinate than what this uh, vestibule would imply. I mean, if this this whole building had been designed at once, at once <laughs> um, that's what it kind of looks like. Uh, it doesn't really uh, relate to how the changes have occurred over time. And that's that's where my difficulty is. I mean, I, I mean, in, in the country club, I know that replication or is usually um, given more um, acceptability than it would be in other districts. And I appreciate that. I think this is just a step too far. Do we know, um, or maybe the architect or the applicant knows, what that facade looked like before the addition, that is the south facade? And did that at one time have a main entrance on it? And, and, and was it uh, eliminated when the uh, first addition was scabbed on? And if it if it was, then I mean, it, 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 then we're talking about what was a secondary entrance as the primary entrance. I just don't know. Well, I mean, do you, they, do you know? Go ahead. I, it, most of the south facade is intact, um, so I think probably best shown in this dimension here um, on the screen. Uh, <laughs> you share the screen. Um, so the sunroom is a historic addition that they are proposing to modify, and the existing um, addition footprint is at the rear. So there wasn't an entrance on this elevation, and that shows in the sandboard maps too. Um, and I would like to point out this addition does not require review by the Country Club neighborhood. But they did review it and they also had concerns over this new entrance on the um, facade. And again, we're not opposed to them having a door here or a walkway here. It's the visual prominence of them. And I cannot do two things at once. So I am going to share my screen now and point out what I'm talking about. <laughs> Well, she's doing that I mean, based on my experience and looking at the floor plan, the side entrance on the north, the way the interior is configured, that was, was, that was the original main entry. There might have been a secondary entry on the south facade or on the east facade. Um, so this is the north facade here. Um, and the primary entrance. Um, it's pretty decorative, uh, difficult to photograph because it is interior lot. And this is the south facade here. Um, and again, this uh, this one story bump out right here is historic and original to the structure. And you can see that the existing addition is placed so far to the back um, that Again, I don't know if there wasn't a secondary entrance, but it's clear that this definitely was the project. I see. So it, it sounds like then, you know, Aaron, your comments to the site plan, I think, make a lot of sense. I appreciate that. And then the idea that this door and its functionality makes sense, but how it's expressed is maybe the, I think the nature of staff's comment, but it sounds like maybe the territory that we're circling around as well. Any other thoughts to add on that? Waiting for any further inspiration. Talking about uh, conditions number two and three here briefly. The the site wall. I think with the clarification on the Denver Hill that was helpful. Uh, unless there's any other comments with respect to the site plan and the the landscape wall. And again, additional fixture details um, seem straightforward. Also, are there any other comments or commissioners? In that case, is anyone brave enough to try to push it? <laughs> if we feel like we reached a, a relative consensus. Well, I, uh, 
I think I'm I'm in total support of the staff's recommendations, and uh, it's a beautiful uh, addition and and uh, minor reworking of the historic and the non-historic um, portions of the house. And I think Gary is right; you you almost can't tell if it's if it's original, <laughs> and so. Yes, the, the entrance is the entrance, and I will support staff on uh, that 65 square foot, 60 square foot addition. Uh, might be a bit much, so. It's just beautiful. Yes, with respect to deliberation, we provided enough kind of clarity or conversation to help with that process. So I think Aaron made a really good points about the site wall. I don't know if I have clarity from the rest of you guys. If you're in agreement with that, I want to add that to the condition. Um, I would discuss that further. I think that in a roundabout way, the the site wall and the opening is, it speaks to those bigger the context of the patterns, right? And, mm -hmm. and how that reads and with the way that guideline 3.3 um, you know, mentions it actually goes for the don't get A and C, but retain the appearance of or an orientation of that historic part. I think that site wall and that entry sequence speaks to the orientation piece of maybe that not to be So, uh, you say that was yeah, it's the hierarchy of openings. And I'm not clear from our deliberations if we're suggesting to use this is bigger. Completely eliminate the 60 foot square addition or just to simplify it or modify it so that it's not so prominent. I'm not clear on what the discussion is exactly. Is the same size or small? I guess I, I throw my hat in the to simplify, but yeah. remain, you know, as a second, a true secondary. Yeah, maybe I overstated. I think simplify is, is better. Well, that's no, where no objections to a doorway there, but. Confirming because the condition does say to eliminate because I mean it could go two ways. You could still have a small addition there to act as a vestibule or an enclosed porch, or it's a door without any a stoop or something. I'm just Cremont. not trying to design it. I'm just trying to understand. Well, I think that's the trouble with with trying to if if we just uh, talk about uh, simplifying the addition without being uh, clear about the elimination of the 64 square foot addition. Um, not sure that the desired intent can be achieved. Um, I think it's the addition and its detailing that makes that uh, compete for a main entry. I don't know, I mean, you'd say, would a 30 square foot addition be okay? And I, I don't know, I think, I, I would prefer to leave the uh, staff's recommended language intact and then let the applicant try to figure out how to address the issue, which is creating what appears to be a main entrance yes, okay. on that base, base of the building. And if they can do it with a smaller addition that doesn't compete, that I think is up for the uh, negotiation between the staff and the applicant. But if we don't, if we don't include the language about eliminating the 60 square foot addition, I think it'll be difficult to achieve the commission's intent, which is to avoid having prominent entrance on that piece of the building. So maybe to I mean the vestibule doesn't isn't an airlock. I mean it's <laughs> It's open to the room inside. It's not an airlock there, so it's not an environmental concern. Um, traditionally, in buildings of this era, entries often had a step down. Uh, when you stepped up into the living space, that was kind of trapped cold air. Um, this entry doesn't do that, so it's it's really um, it, for me. It really does seem to look like it's becoming the main entry, uh, regardless of how it be used. Yeah, I think if we, if we just say simplify, then we have to prescribe what it is that is, so what is, is making what, it too complicated. Yeah, right? if it's the same size and simplify, yeah. what does that mean? Uh, do, the, do all the 
windows go away. You know, I don't know. I mean, that's I would I would rather let the staff's recommended condition stand and then mm -hmm. uh, have the uh, applicant figure out how they're going to respond. So does that that proposed door and vestibule the south side and speaking to the site plan and mm -hmm. that the sidewalk that extends up from the east west sidewalk on the third um, do you propose to uh, eliminate that as well so that that's just a door to the yard or is I, I, there's no mention of that as a, a condition but i think that, that if the issue is is that it has to be secondary one of the things that makes it primary is the treatment of that gate, the gate in the um, landscape wall. I mean, I I specifically didn't say that as a condition, but I am also not a trained landscape architect like Aaron is, and I feel like that's pretty astute. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> if you had an entry there, I think you need to have a walk at some location, and I would prefer it be the straightest, shortest thought to the adjacent sidewalk and have it meander through the yard. I will say I but I, I do trust Christian as a designer. I, I, I do too. My to my point was it. really about the width of an opening and creating just a visual hierarchy that the main entry off of Lafayette is just wider and more prominent and make the secondary entry just snugged up. I mean, you could also do it. You could also do it. You know, the column heights. There's various ways they could look at how to design the site wall to indicate primary versus secondary. Yeah, the, the, the and I'm not plan, prescribing that. The site plan of the sheet is that it's the sixth in the packet. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, it implies that I mean, everything that, that's shown there makes it look like this is going to be the, the more important entry. It does, and I think there's ways to you know, play that down and make the existing primary entry, you know, more grand with the site plan and the walls and, you know, there's a variety of ways to do it. I think, um, you know, and I would just suggest they restudy that too. I think Kristen's a very good designer and here is your deliberation. I think mm -hmm. we can probably work together yeah. to combine all these things. Um, to to get to something is appropriate. If again, if staff doesn't feel like it's meeting the commission's conditions, we can always bring it back. Or if there's something totally different that person wants to propose, like she can bring that back too. Um, but you brave enough on this one. <laughs> but you all do collectively have to vote together to pass a motion. <laughs> It sounds like, you know, maybe in summary, the combination of site treatment and scale and detailing all combined to a new solution here that doesn't mean eliminating access from the street or the second door. Right. So I think functionally I just want to add one more thing because you asked it, Nick, since you're newer to the commission. We have had questions in the past about primary and secondary entries on projects and wanting to you know, prospective applicants wanting to reorient that. And we have denied in the past of completely changing the orientation of the front of the building on corners. There have been some interesting it's been addresses changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's been some address changes. It can be a tricky subject that we have addressed it in the past. Okay, I guess try this. Okay. I move to conditionally approve application number 2023-COA-275 for the addition and alterations at 300 Lafayette Street as per country club design guidelines B2 through B4 and B7. Design guidelines 2.18, 2.20, 3.3 through 3.9, 5.8, 5.18, Character defining features for the Country Club Historic District presented testimony 
submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. One, eliminate the 60 square foot addition on the south elevation that creates the appearance of a primary entry and instead use a secondary entry design to avoid competing with the primary entrance. <laughs> Two, confirm the maximum site wall height and fence height from the highest point in grade on the property. Three, provide additional details on light fixtures and locations and ensure they comply with guidelines 5.17 and 5.8. And four, restudy the site plan and site wall to create a hierarchy of entries. Sorry. I may make just one thing. I can do that as the chair. Uh, yes. Condition three, you said 5.8. Oh, yes. Um, in that case, I agree with that. Yeah, and I accept mm -hmm. that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Staying? Five votes. Uh, Good luck. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, our next and last design review project for the day is application 2023-08-281 at 3000 East 7th Avenue in the East 7th Avenue Historic District. And this is a, another corner change of address, <laughs> uh, front door and not the this door. Is one of them. So we'll let Brittany lead up with the staff president. Not so, a widely read. <laughs> So this is um, also for an addition uh, to 3000 East 7th Avenue, which is also one of those storybook <laughs> Tudor style homes. Um, this uh, structure historically did front onto Milwaukee Street um, that I can see clearly in the Sanborn maps as there wasn't even an address along 7th Avenue for this property. Um, and this facade in the image you have on the screen here is actually the Milwaukee Street facade and not the East 7th Avenue facade. However, um, at some point during the district's period of significance, it did get readdressed to East 7th Avenue. And this is East 7th Avenue along the parkway. My inclination here would be because um, having a home along the parkway is a status symbol. Um, however, there was a uh, there is a door on this elevation here um, where the address is, and it is not entirely clear to staff when that door was added to the facade or if that door is original. Um, but looking at footprints, it is definitely not the original primary entrance, as in the way we interpret the historic primary entrance, which fronted onto Milwaukee Street. Um, it does have a walkway that comes from the corner, as you can see in this aerial image here. And this home does have a very steeply pitched roof with a unique um, tile roof. Um, so here is the uh, existing site plan um, with the proposed rear addition. And the rear addition is for um, an office and a larger garage space. It will be located at the rear and on the south of the property and will not be visible from the public right away. It is a one-story addition. Um, and then there is also an addition proposed on the south elevation at this patio area um, that is within the original building footprint that will bump out the kitchen space. So we'll look at that more closely in floor plan. Um, but there, again, here is the historic door. There is a door on this elevation here, which is now where the address is located. Um, staff, again, do not know specifically when that door was added, um, but you can best see it in this photograph here that I'll zoom in on. So again, the original entrance there along Milwaukee Street, new door here um, in, this, uh, in this alcove here. And this building footprint is historic and has not been altered. Um, but again, based on some of the architectural detailing, staff are very sure that this door fronted onto this house fronted onto Milwaukee. For example, this uh, buttress kind of detailing here, um, and how secondary the uh, East Seventh Avenue facade is to this front facade. Um, this home has gone through some alterations in terms of second floor, so there are some 
non-historic dormers on this um, structure here, but they are not visible from the public right of way. Um, and most of the basement windows have been replaced with vinyl windows, um, which you can see an image of those basement windows here. But on the first floor, the original steel windows are intact and the applicant is proposing to keep those windows, just remove the security bars from those windows that are blocking um, their operation and views. Um, so here are the uh, proposed and um, existing floor plans with demolition notes. Um, so there will be an extensive amount of demolition to the interior, but um, that is not within our purview. So along the um, East 7th Avenue facade, the applicant is proposing to introduce new egress light wells um, along the elevation. This will involve cutting down existing openings um, to accommodate those new light wells and then new light wells on the south elevation as well. Staff are asking for clarification on the egress well material, which is proposed to be a steel um, material. We do require along the street frontages that wells um, be a matte finish and do not project more than six uh, um, inches above the right of way. Um, the applicant, I believe, does have additional information that they wish to discuss in terms of the materials for the egress wells, particularly along 7th. On the first floor, um, particularly in this area here along the south elevation, uh, this alcove that is recessed will be pulled out to be coplanar with the rest of the wall side to allow for a larger kitchen. Um, staff did not have concerns over this alteration as this, this facade is um, interior lot and not visible from the public right of way. It will have the same material cladding, but the windows and window operations are slightly different than the historic windows. There will be a bifold um, operable steel window in this uh, uh, elevation, so it will be distinguishable as new. And then on the um, second floor, um, there aren't too many changes proposed, but you will have this garage addition that is added to the rear of the existing attached garage. Um, the applicant is proposing to demolish this pergola structure that is on the south. Um, initially, they were proposing to remove it from the project scope, but now it will be moved to the back where the office is. Um, this is something staff can review administratively, so I don't have major concerns over that. And in terms of demolition to the historic structure, mostly um, eaves and gutters will be removed from the existing historic garage and then minimal demolition to the garage roof and this uh, bump out bay on the rear is proposed. Um, these elevation drawings, again, are just showing the removal of those uh, steel uh, um, security bars from the steel windows. So no changes are proposed to the original windows on these elevations that are along the primary street, um, but the egress uh, windows on the East 7th Avenue elevation will be expanded with new wells um, cut down there. Um, initially, the applicant was proposing to this facade where the door is on East 7th Avenue to convert that into a window opening. Now the applicant would like to um, infill that opening entirely, and they have proposed to inset that opening. I do think this would be a good discussion for the commission to have, because again, I'm not sure if that door is original or not, um, and if that's appropriate. This is the secondary facade, and we do allow for changes on secondary facades. Um, as you can see, the East 7th Avenue facade, which is this elevation on the bottom, is is very secondary to the Milwaukee Street elevation. Uh, here is the alterations to the south and rear. Um, so as you can see, this structure has a very steeply pitched roof. The new garage addition will have a um, much less um, pitched to the roof. Um, the profile matches, but it is not as tall. So staff do feel that it helps distinguish that addition as new. Um, the stucco cladding that is proposed for this addition is very similar to the stucco cladding uh, for the existing structure, but again, the windows do distinguish that addition as new. Um, it is not inset um, from the historic attached garage, but it is inset from this historic projecting bay turret here um, as it does project. 
And again, this is uh, the south elevation where um, it will be infilled where it's currently recessed and you have that uh, bifold operable window and then a large um, operable door there, which I think will help distinguish that as new as well. So here are just some renderings of that proposed addition. Generally, staff are supportive. Um, we just have a few conditions, and that condition for this particular home is confirm window well protrusions, um, and that make finish will be used on the north elevation. Um, and our guidelines again say six inches of upgrade, and then provide additional features, uh, additional details on the light fixtures and locations, and ensure they comply with guideline 5.17 and 5. I did not turn my camera on that whole time. <laughs> Oops. Brittany's still here for the record. Um, commissioners, any questions for staff? In that case, we'll uh, invite the applicants to share. You have 10 minutes to present. Please start with your name and address for the record. Okay. Thanks, Brittany. You guys hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, board. Thanks for having us. We all really appreciate it. Um, I'm Bain Carlson. I'm an architect with Factor Design Build. Um, I don't have a, a ton to say. I will cover a few of the points that uh, Brittany talked about. Um, uh, as far as the facade changes on the Milwaukee and 7th Street, um, Really, the only things that you'll see are the removal of the um, security bars on the windows. Uh, and then also, uh, we'd like to talk about that um, secondary kind of faux entry door that goes into the living room right now that faces 7th. Um, the owners had wanted to either change that to a window or uh, brick it in because people get confused about which is the actual entry door at the house. Um, so currently we would like to fill in that opening uh, with stucco and just recess it. So you still see the ghost of that opening. Uh, so we'd like to get your thoughts on that. Um, for all the basement windows, there are existing window wells that are metal. Um, we will be replacing those, digging them out deeper for larger egress windows. Um, they will have a matte finish and they'll protrude about four inches above grade. Um, so we will submit that uh, info uh, to staff. Um, the owners have actually since um, wanted to change those metal window wells to uh, like a landscape block, a concrete block. Um, uh, we did get a comment back from staff that that wouldn't comply with the guidelines because they aren't uh, masonry, um, which they are technically masonry, but it looks like in your glossary. Uh, to be masonry, it requires that the blocks have uh, mortar joints, which these don't have. Um, so I guess if you have any input on that, we're fine either way. Uh, if we can't go with the, the masonry, we'll stick with the metal. Uh, let's see. The light fixtures, uh, we did not have selected when we made our initial application. We are um, replacing a couple of the existing sconces on the exterior, uh, and then also adding a couple at each of the new um, patio entrances on the south facade. Um, so we have selected something that goes with the Tudor style of the house, uh, and we will submit that to the staff for their review. Um, other than that, I don't really have much to say. I don't just say thanks for your time and reviewing this project. All right. Thank you very much. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Uh, you mentioned the, the, where the north door used to be. Yeah. In recessed stucco, but the drawings clearly show a window. They do. We originally, the owners had wanted that replaced with a window. Uh, so that's what you're, and that's what we included the application. Um, they've since changed their minds and would just like that infilled to be a solid wall. Um, 
So you can't look into their living room basically as you come up to the main entry. Um, on past projects when we've infilled doors or windows, I know staff has asked that we recess that plane so that you know you can see the ghost of that opening. Um, so that's the direction we'd like to go if you if you all approve. Thank you for clarifying. So that's what we're reviewing. The, the change as verbally proposed. Um, no. So the the change. Um, I, I was told about it yesterday. Um, I would like the commission to discuss it because staff has recommended the if an opening is infilled that it be inset. However, I had a project recently in Alamo Posita where staff did not feel, or sorry, commission did not feel the same as staff. So I would love the commission to give clear direction on if you think converting that to a, a window opening as shown today is appropriate, and filling is appropriate, and if and filling is appropriate, how that would be and filled. So um, you you would still need to give some kind of conditional approval on that because it doesn't quite reflect what is before you today. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Um, we would look to see if there's any public comment at this time. Um, for the record, no one else here in person, just don't mind. Doesn't look like any raised hands, so we'll move into deliberation. I have a question for speaker. staff first. The applicant mentioned Tudor style. I'd consider this French provincial. Would that be not that it may necessarily <laughs> makes a difference, but when looking at light fixtures that are going to be appropriate to the style, mm -hmm. I think it might be better to have that more correctly stated. I have seen the fixtures. I didn't have major concerns over them. I will definitely relate that to them. Which provincials are more snooty than <laughs> <laughs> something? And then I um I did have some follow-up. Um I did indicate to the applicant that we probably would not be okay with the landscape block for the egress wells, particularly along East 7th Avenue. Um we just have recently started to uh, allow the stacked landscape block for retaining walls, but I have concerns over using a stacked block for an egress well right adjacent to historic fabric. Um, but it is a concrete block, um, but our guidelines, they use concrete um, steel wells with a, a matte finish or other masonry materials. And that's my opinion. Um, should we start with the front entry and the door window wall recess? I, I, should, I think eliminating the door and filling the opening with a slight recess is probably the most sympathetic approach for this particular building. Um, and that door is kind of centered in that wall and um, I just think that's, I think I'd actually prefer that to a window, that location. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a nod to, to what was there, the as well as the, you know, the opening is um, similar to the opening for the real front door in terms of it's kind of, it's not actually an arch, it's kind of a three centered arch. Kind of thing. So are you saying that filling in the opening, but ghosting it? Yes, recessing the, the infill yeah. somewhat. Two to four inches. Oh, yeah, but I would say. I mean, in this case, it's almost the opposite of what we just deliberated about on the last one, where we have a, a non primary mm -hmm. primary entrance that's being re, re primary, however, you would say that. Uh, but it, so I, yeah, here, I think that I would agree. Well, I'm not sure that that was when that door was installed, that that was intended to be the primary entrance. Correct. Because um, I don't think you, you know, I, I'd like to know how long that tile address was has been there. <laughs> the door might have been, you know, who knows what the history of that is. But. 
Um, I'm trying to discern just through the photograph I'm looking at. Is there a step up to that door? Yeah. Or is there a planter? It looks like on page the 24th page of the packet has a really good photograph of both entries. There is kind of like a step up stoop for the whole entry area. This, this image. Yeah, it's just hard to see. The one that's on the right is the one we're talking about, and there's something blocking the view. It looks like the maybe that initial step up is in plane, but each threshold is a further step up. Maybe mm -hmm. it looks like there's like to a six that. inch patio and then another six inch step up into the. I'm looking at Google Earth, and it looks like it's there's a two foot. Something or no, there's a bench in front of it. Oh, it, yeah, they put a bench in front of that. But um, the, the sill of the door looks like it's at the top of the bench, or no? Uh, I think, yeah. Oh, there it's down here. That's a bench. I'm gonna put a concrete bench here. Eight or 12 shows a pretty good, yeah, kind of side on here. Um, we'll be for, on door. so we're gonna probably talk about this again and again relative to the ghosting of the windows, but I think I was the person that had the objection to the one in Alamo Placido, and that was a Placido, that was a particular instance where we were smearing it. So the window wasn't exactly in the same location and you were ghosting the other window, but not in its entirety. So it looked kind of like a blur or a mistake. Um, so that was the objection I had there as to why you shouldn't do a recess. In this instance, I, I don't view it to be important to be ghosted. Um, I, I, I read that guideline, you know, and it, to me, it was written when you have a field of windows in a, say, a four-story brick warehouse structure and you're going to eliminate four of them in a cluster. And that's going to compromise that entire um, uh, facade and, and the history of that facade. Then you ghost those. You, you, you go ahead and you recess those and you keep the pattern in its entirety. In this instance, it's a standalone piece. The arch architect argues that it was added in, a, in the first place, it wasn't original. And so therefore, for me, I mean, I can make the argument that it shouldn't be ghosted at all. It should just be smooth. I think in this case, look, I appreciate your example of, you know, kind of a major fenestration pattern, right? That you want to first as a one-off, but I guess from the perspective of either, you know, something that, does not appear to be original based on sandboard layouts and address. You know, but evolves and tells a bit of a story too. I, I think I could go either way on that just by virtue of not being a character defining original feature, perhaps, but also being a, an existing condition or part of the record of the building. So, you know, I, I guess I'm comfortable with the idea of a solid infill versus a window, which the applicant specifically mentioned. I think it sounds like we are together um i guess my my recommendation is just from a more practical standpoint that by recessing it i mean there's going to be a crack between the infill and the rest of the wall and i'd rather have the crack on an interior corner in a recess than on a surface of a, a functional. functional wall now, now they can do it so that it probably won't crack but it'll crack and I hate to see an opening the posting to a by a crack rather than actually saying, you know, there's a door. Somebody put a door here and now we're filling it. That's just a practical. I mean, I hear what you're saying and I agree with, you know, that it probably was a flesh wall, but now that they're going to infill it, um, I, I would just propose that they leave it to their discretion. I will say the applicant said they were okay. <laughs> was that yeah. yeah. So I don't know if. I think if you're comfortable with it being infilled, I think the applicant has indicated their preferred approach. So that but it still needs to be a condition. Yes. It's not in the current mill. 
we can have that. And the other two conditions be the window well and then the light fixtures. Um, thoughts on the window well, the, the concrete masonry unit versus a well, concrete masonry unit that is mortar, but not the landscape blocks up there, I think, which would probably come with a slip base and all that kind of stuff. And it's just inconsistent with this district. I mean, that doesn't exist anywhere in the district. It's inconsistent with the style of the building, and it's inconsistent with the district. So I, I don't, I wouldn't find that acceptable. And I think if you were to use the unmortared landscape block, you'd probably want some sort of batter in it. And then you're completely changing the aesthetic versus the straight down window well versus a battered. Right. I think those blocks are probably designed to be battered. They are. It's they're, they're not overly wide open too. There's the one double, but then you know, three single openings with that bigger massive block. I, I know the applicant had indicated they were comfortable with the metal still to ask the questions. I think if we're comfortable with the condition as staff wrote it, um, it sounds like that's mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing. Uh, and then life issues in the French provincial and not to the traditional. I'm sure staff will handle that. <laughs> Are there any other comments or, or is there another address change involved here? Yeah, back to uh back to a side street. I guess at this point it will remain. Mm -hmm. So we don't look at address statements um, ever. <laughs> so I mean, maybe, but that's not something we would look at. Well, you're filling in the. Well, I I I think isn't the official address two thousand East Seventh Avenue yeah. Parkway? Yeah, as opposed to the I think the same board says six sixty eight Milwaukee Road. Like that. Just say if you're going to ghost the door, ghost the numbers too. Well. So it's, but the, <laughs> The numbers yeah. are on tile embedded in the stock. Oh, oh 3,000. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. So it does okay. that way. Well, it sounds like we're at yeah. or close to a consensus if someone would like to make a motion. And just a reminder on that extra condition for the front door. I moved to conditionally approve application number 2023-COA-281 for the addition and alterations at 3000 East 7th Avenue Parkway as per design guidelines 2.18, 2.20, 3.3 through 3.9, 5.6, 5.18, character defining features for the East 7th Avenue Historic District, presented testimony, submitted documentation and information provided in the staff report with the following conditions. Confirm window well protrusion and mat well finish at finish on the north elevation. To provide additional details on the light fixtures and locations and ensure they comply with guidelines 5.17 and 5.18. And three, um, go in build uh, exterior door on the north elevation as a uh, slightly recessed in film condition. Motion, is there a second? Second. Or the second, all, right. all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Staying? Five votes, the motion carries. Congratulations, good luck with the project. And with that, we don't have any business items for today. Well, I have nothing I put officially on the agenda, <laughs> but I have perhaps. an announcement. <laughs> um, so we are kicking off phase two of the design guideline updates. We're going to uh, focus on topics um, related to windows, accessory dwelling units, um, small structures that are not ADUs, so like sheds and stuff and chicken coops and things of that nature. <laughs> um, some just clarifi additional clarifications of site work. Um, I don't know if I said accessibility, but looking at accessibility again. So we are going to start um, that with just a conversation on Windows, and we'll be hosting community meetings um, in person and online to just focus on the Windows discussion. as it's been a big discussion in the past, um, and we are Anticipating the Windows um, online meeting will be August 29th, and the in-person meeting will be September 6th. 
still looking at spaces for where that will be. Um, but just wanted to update you on that. Thank you. And we can participate in that without restriction, or how does that work? <laughs> That's listening. You can listen to the community meeting. You can okay. provide me with comments. Okay. For okay. sure. Um, right. And any of the landmark staff on that. So have you reviewed chicken coops lately? We not lately. <laughs> but we do review a few of them every now and then. This is like that appropriate weather bank. Right. Surprised at what we get. Perhaps with that, we will close the meeting. Yep. And it is 2.58 for the record. All right.